Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I would like to talk about orbital mechanics in Kerbal Space Program. Specifically, I want to talk about gravity assist, because of course we just had the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft fly past the Earth and do a maneuver which uh, is kind of familiar and yet different if you know what you're looking for. So gravity assists ha are a standard tool of astro navigation that we find uh, these days. I mean, they kind of came to prominence really with the Voyager probes, but you know, they, they were used for a long time. For example, the early Luna 3 spacecraft used a gravity assist with respect to the moon to make sure it ended up in a suitable orbit to relay the science back to the Earth. Now a gravity assist is of course what happens when you fly past a planet and uh, it let its gravity affect the orbit of the spacecraft and in this case you see I'm going from a lower energy orbit and we fly past uh, Eve here now we're gonna fly past uh, we come in almost radial with respect to Eve in this case and it very slightly changes the orbit and then as we leave we now find ourselves on this much higher energy orbit. So we have gained energy by flying past Eve. And the real, tr uh, the real key to this is this hyperbolic encounter. Now many people look at gravity assists and they uh, think in terms of energy being gained. Now it's important to realize that there is energy being gained or lost, but uh, that is with respect to the sun. Inside this uh, encounter with the planet, it's important to realize that this is just a hyperbolic orbit, right? That means an orbit with an eccentricity which is way greater than one. Um, and what happens is, of course, you start here with a specific velocity. This is 3206. And as you fall down to periaps, you gain a little velocity because of gravity. You, so we've gained almost a kilometer per second. And then as we warp, as we travel back out, we lose all that energy and we essentially enter this sphere of influence and leave the sphere of influence with exactly the same um, velocity with respect to the planet, right? In the planet's reference frame, we have just done a simple Keplerian orbit and the laws of conservation of energy mean that we must enter and leave with exactly the same velocity. But you'll notice that the direction changed, and that is where the magic actually happens. So I gave up trying to make it clear in Kerbal Space Program and decided to use the magic of Microsoft Paint. So yeah, uh, this is a very simple diagram. Now, many of you will immediately get confused because the coordinate system is backwards, and that's because if you look down on the planetary system of the Earth or Kerbin uh, from the North Pole, then the planets move anti-clockwise. So if we imagine a space probe moving outwards past a planet, a space probe which has a certain velocity, in this case I both gave both objects a velocity of 1, and I said that it's moving an angle of A relative to the planet, you can figure out the X and Y components of the orbit. Now, of course, then you subtract out the velocity of the planet, which has velocity of X equals 1 and the velocity of Y is 0. That gives you the relative velocity as 0.765. See, that's super easy. Now, from there, you can either deflect it, say, all the way forwards, right? So you're basically taking the relative velocity in the frame of reference of the planet and now making sure it goes all the way along the orbit. And guess what? You end up with a maximum velocity or perfect assist velocity of 1.765. And that is actually above escape velocity because escape velocity is roughly 40% bigger than the orbital velocity. Similarly, if you take that same encounter geometry and instead have it come around the other side of the planet and slow down as much as possible, then it will end up in an orbit that will be its apoapse and its, uh, you know, minimum velocity with respect to the sun will be 0.235. So you've essentially slowed the orbit down. Now that we've cleared that up, I want to talk about OSIRIS-REx. Now, it actually does something really quite fascinating because when it launched from Earth, it actually launched towards the sun. 
And it launched onto a shorter period orbit initially. It's a semi-major axis was something like 0.97. Now that's interesting because Bennu is actually on a longer period orbit. So to the uneducated eye, this looked like they had launched the spacecraft to nowhere. But then in December 2016, after a few months in orbit at perihelion, it made a 500 meter per second burn, which basically uh, accelerated its orbit, raised its aphelion, and brought it back to an encounter with Earth in September 22nd, uh, 2017. And here it came back and flew over the South Pole. And in doing so, it got a gravity assist lifting it up into the six degree orbit plane which Bennu is orbiting in. Now this extra trip around the sun added essentially a whole year to its outbound trip, but there was good reason for it. By using that 500 meters per, meters per second burn, it meant that when it came back to the Earth, it was actually traveling about one kilometer per second faster with respect to the Earth. So that when it got its orbit deflected, it was like it had gained one kilometer per second of delta V that it couldn't have got originally at launch. If you remember, OSIRIS-REx launched using only a single solid rocket booster attached to the side of its Atlas V. They could have gone directly to a Bennu transfer orbit, I don't doubt. But they would have needed more of those expensive bolt-on boosters or possibly less spacecraft so they could get more Delta V. It is important to realize that if you leave Earth at a certain velocity and then you swing around the sun and then come back to Earth without having encountered any other objects, without having performed any deep space maneuvers, you will actually arrive back at Earth at exactly the same velocity because the Earth's eccentricity is pretty low. So that deep space maneuver is essential to make sure that they can uh, take advantage of the Earth's gravity. You could go from Earth to Venus and back to Earth and get gravity assist that way, but instead they elect to perform a deep space maneuver. They did about 500 meters per second, and I think the ultimate gain when they included the uh, a gravity of the Earth it turned out to be, yeah, about, f uh, about one kilometer per second extra. So that's like a solid gain, thanks to the magic of mathematics. Now, another really important factor when computing gravity assists is that uh, the, the amount of turn, the amount of deflection you can get by flying close to a body depends upon the mass of the body. It depends upon the speed at which you are going. And there is a point at which when you get close to the body in question, uh, you cannot turn anymore because you will end up hitting the object. Here you can see that my apoapse with respect to the sun is going higher and higher, but my periapse required to get the curve is getting lower and lower. And at some point, I'm essentially flying into EVE instead. Now, if you treat EVE as a point mass with no limits on how close you can get, then sure, you can get a gravity assist that would take me almost all the way out to Joule from this particular orbit. But of course, those would actually fly through the planet, so they're not actually very useful. Perhaps if you were, say, some weakly interacting massive particle that was doing this, that would work. You could just phase through solid matter and not worry about it. But unfortunately, spaceships, at least in, uh, in my experience, don't tend to fly through planets intact. So the actual mathematics for the hyperbolic orbit are super, super trivial. I mean, yeah, there's a lot of important stuff you can look at, but these are the numbers that you actually really care about. So if you're coming in from infinity, Right, you have something called the impact parameter and the hyperbolic excess velocity. That is, the velocity you have just before you enter the sphere of influence. And the impact parameter is how far you would miss the target if it didn't have any gravitational force pulling you in. So you take these two numbers, this is V and B. Now, you can compute the semi-major axis, even though it's a hyperbolic orbit, you can compute this value. It's, it's a minus gm, m of course being the mass of the body, divided by v squared. Like, that's basically the same thing that you would get, but it's negative, right, for, um, for a regular orbit, right? 
Now, the eccentricity, as you know, always has to be greater than 1 for a hyperbolic orbit. And it's simple. It's the square root of 1 plus b squared over a squared. Now, of course, b is the impact parameter, a is the semi-major axis, and you get this number. And then once you have the eccentricity and the semi-major axis, you can flip that around and get the periapsis distance to figure out how close it's going to be, therefore knowing if you're going to smash into the planet or not. And also, given the eccentricity, you can figure out what's called the asymptote angle. That's basically if you project the orbits back to infinity and you measure the angle between the incoming and the outgoing orbit, then that's your asymptotes angle, and that's the, the arc cosine of minus 1 over e. Or, more importantly, what you're probably concerned about is how much is the orbit deflected, and that's uh, 2 times the arc sine, or the inverse sine, of 1 over the eccentricity. See, this is all pretty simple, and of course you can flip this around, say, if I need a deflection angle of a certain amount, can I do it for a planet of mass M, or will I end up smashing into the ground trying to get so close? So yeah, this is just a very basic lesson to try and give you the mathematics, the idea behind the geometry, so you can understand what's really going on. Again, the important thing to realize is that once you're in a specific reference frame, you're not gaining or losing energy. You know, energy is conserved. It's the rotation of the vector, it's the transformation between one coordinate frame and the other that actually makes the gravity assist uh, mathematics actually work. Of course, it goes without saying that in the real universe as well, that uh, the gravity assist is a mutual experience. Because your spacecraft is flying by Jupiter and getting a huge boost to its velocity, Jupiter is also being tugged on by the gravity of the spacecraft, slowing Jupiter down ever so much. It's not like we would notice Jupiter slowing down, but I tell you what would notice? The laws of physics, because in this universe we respect the conservation of energy and momentum. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>